uh, hi year 12s uh, this is the third and final video in the evolution of life powerpoint the first unit in the evolution topic for the year 12 SAS curriculum uh, in this powerpoint we're going to be looking at comparative genomics so how we compare different genomes techniques used etc okay let's, let's start okay so the first thing we're going to have to do to understand this is obviously look at the term comparative genomics and figure out what that actually means. So when we talk about comparative genomics, what we're actually talking about is a field of biological research in which researchers or scientists compare the genomes of organisms to look for similarities or differences between those two or three genomes. Um, that allows us, the evidence that they find in that research allows us to make inferences about the different relationships between organisms, so have they evolved alongside each other, has one evolved before the other, has one evolved from the other, etc. It also gives us an idea on their appearance, behaviour, the biochemistry of the living things and how that's actually changed through time. So it allows us to actually compare that. And we also get these wonderful techniques, so DNA, DNA hybridization, DNA profiling, amino acid sequencing, all allow, which allow us to determine the evolutionary relationships between different animals. So, now that we know what comparative genomics is, let's move on a little bit to we'll talk about a bit more. <coughs> so, we have three different techniques which I've mentioned on the last slide. Amino acid sequencing, DNA profiling, and DNA to DNA hybridization. Now, the first one, amino acid sequencing, is literally scientists comparing the primary structure or the amino acid sequence of proteins to determine the evolutionary relationships between two species based on the similarities and differences in those amino acid sequences of the proteins. Remember, most of the proteins in living things are very similar. So amino acid sequencing, just comparing the amino acid sequence of proteins in multiple species. Uh, the next one here, DNA profiling. So first off, scientists have to extract DNA from different organisms, analyze the genomes, and find the genes that are common in both those organisms. Um, now, the target gene that they're looking for, or the common genes they're looking for, all contain variable number tandem repeats, or VNTRs. And as we've learned from the DNA topic, VNTRs are all unique to every organism, and sometimes even to the individual organism. Well, once we've found that VNTR we're looking for, we isolate the target gene using restriction enzymes, and then we use the target DNA and amplify it with PCR, so polymerase chain reaction. We then transfer that amplified DNA to a gel and we go through gel electrophoresis like we've done in class. Once we've done that, we have a DNA profile for the two different species through the gel electrophoresis and we can compare the similarities and differences of the two profiles based on the electrophoresis. Now you guys have done that, it was in your DNA, pro or in DNA and proteins test, so you should be quite good with that. Uh, lastly, we want to look at DNA to DNA hybridization. So this is a process where we take the DNA from two different species. So first off, you get one species of DNA, you heat it up to the point where the weak hydrogen bonds between the nucleotide bases will separate, leaving us two single strands of DNA. You then take a single strand of DNA from another species, add it to the mixture, and let the mixture cool. If those species are closely related genetically, the matched, well, the two strands will bond together tighter than if they weren't closely related genetically. To further give evidence to this theory that they must be closely related because they bonded, you can heat the substance again. If the two species are genetically related very closely, those strands will require higher temperatures to break than they would if they were poorly related. Okay, moving on. Phylogenetic tree diagrams. So these are a type of diagrams that you're going to have to draw and you're going to have to be able to analyze in both the test and the exam. So all it is is a tree diagram that infers evolutionary relationships between individuals and groups of organisms based upon the similarities and differences in both the genetic features and the physical features. If you've got an organism on a phylogenetic tree, it's believed to have a common ancestor with every other organism on that phylogenetic tree. Now we're going to have a look at an example of a phylogenetic tree, which is here, and we're going to talk about a few different key points. Uh, first off, we have points called nodes. So nodes are the points here, 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 
here and here. What a node represents is a common ancestor between the two species. So for the Brewster and the human here, we have this common ancestor here. And it's a bit blurry on the screen to actually read, but whatever that species is there, that is the common ancestor between those two species. Or if we go far enough, okay, the common ancestor between a human and a frog is going to be the amphibia amnicutter, if I'm reading that correctly. Okay, so the nodes are the most common or most recent common ancestor between those species. Um, so lastly, each of the points down here, so like Homo sapiens, the Gigalis, X tropicalis, D. rorio, etc. These are all called terminals, and these are organisms, or terminal represents organisms that share a common ancestor. Okay, so all of these species here, they're all terminals, and they all contain common ancestors. Now, the other thing that we need to learn term wise here is, for example, the rooster and the human here. These are called sister groups because they've both evolved from a common ancestor. So, these two here, sister groups, because they share a common ancestor on the phylogenetic tree. And another way of trying to think of what ones are going to be sister groups is two species that come from the same node. So over here, both the human and the rooster come from the same node, therefore must be sister groups. <coughs> Mutations. So, evolution is driven by mutations. Without mutations, we would not have evolution. Now, we know that the genetic code in DNA, so the specific bases in DNA, tells us the sequence of amino acids that will be put together in proteins. That means that DNA must determine the structure and function of every cell. So DNAs dictate what protein is going to be made, the proteins that are made inside a cell dictate the function of the cell. So DNA determines the structure and function of every cell. Any change in that sequence of DNA will produce a change in the protein that's created, which in turn can change the function of the cell, which in turn will change the characteristics of an individual. Even small changes in DNA can have a major effect. <laughs> um, for example, and we've talked about this before, sickle cell anemia is caused by one nucleotide change in the code of a protein, and that protein obviously is involved with hemoglobin, but one nucleotide change causes sickle cell anemia. Now obviously the rate at which mutations occur will be increased by environmental factors such as heat, radiation, and mutagenic chemicals. Again, we've talked about mutations though quite frequently when we looked at the DNA and proteins topic. That ends our final video for evolution of life. There will be another PowerPoint next week, some more videos next week. Hopefully this has helped a little bit to go along with class.